find out where the residents of Scarborough stand. In 2016's referendum on the legalization of marijuana in the state of Maine, there was a majority that voted no on that question in the town of Scarborough. So we would like to find out where do residents stand today? Have they changed their mind on that question? Do they have a different opinion when it comes to medical use versus adult use? That's the new phrase for recreational use. The state legislature changed it to adult use. Um, and so I've included in your agenda packet a draft of what that survey might look like. This survey is labeled as adult use marijuana survey, but it would, the idea would be that there would be a companion piece that was asking the exact same questions in the exact same way for medical use. We want to make sure that we're consistent in that language so that there's no thought of prejudicing people towards one use or the other. And I would like to call your attention to a couple of things that are different from surveys that we have put out in the past. We try to, in order to encourage as many participants as possible, in the past we have really allowed survey um, takers to remain fully anonymous. Mm -hmm. And that has provided an opportunity, in theory, that people could respond repeatedly if they wished, and it, that there was no requirement that they live in Scarborough. For this issue, staff is recommending that we do have some sort of way to tell who's answering the survey. So we have questions on here that ask, are you a resident of Scarborough? And then we ask them to provide either their name, well, and I think that we should maybe think about having both name and street address or just name, some way for us to confirm that that is in fact a registered either voter or a person who lives in Scarborough. That we have a way to that. So those are, um, that's the only kind of difference with this survey versus other surveys. The questions I think are very straightforward. Um, it asks them if they would support the different types of facilities and asks them if they have any preferences to where those facilities are located. Also gives them an opportunity to let us know where their general level of support for um, marijuana establishments of any kind is. So, you know, we can find out overall as a town where, where are people standing. Are we in either from not at all supportive at a one to very supportive at a five? Are we averaging out at a three to four? That might help shape this conversation. Okay. Uh, I have uh, just a real quick question, and I apologize if it went right over my head. If you can talk about it, but I'm listening to the eye. I'm now the cold, and that's my excuse. But anyway, uh, were we talking about a time frame here about when this would be provided and, meet and feedback given? Absolutely. So I think that, so the state. The state um, regulations go into effect, like I said, December 13th. Our moratorium doesn't expire until after that date. So there's no rush on that front. The, the state um, laws will take effect before our moratorium expires. The, the council has as much time as it wishes to take to um, make these sorts of decisions. Okay. Uh, but I do think that there's some benefit, especially to our business community, for moving forward faster rather than taking our time that is maybe not necessary. So if we could agree on survey language, possibly this evening would be lovely, um, then staff could use the month of October to conduct those surveys. And maybe, depending on what we have for response rates, we could report back at that meeting October 18, or possibly need that meeting in November to report back what those those survey results are. How are you proposing to have people volunteer? To fill out the survey? Yeah. So I thought we could do a couple of things. I think we can partner with, um, so certainly it will be, I've built the survey in Google Forms, so it's, it's something that we can put out um, through the internet, through our Facebook page, website, and e-newsletter. I thought we could also, I've got a meeting with the superintendent on Monday to see how we can make sure that the survey is getting into our schools and to the families in those schools to hear directly from them. And I think we can do the same sort of outreach efforts with things like Psycho in the Chamber, so we can get some business community um, opinions as well. And we can take paper copies of the survey to, to populations that we think are not as likely to engage with us online. So take them to, for instance, like the 55 plus lunches mm -hmm. or events to, um, to get out there, I thought, as I often do, meet with the library staff, direct them to where they can find the survey so that if people come in to ask questions, there'll be somebody on the staff, especially at the research, uh, uh, the research desk, um, that can help guide people on the computers that are at the library to have the, to where to find the survey to fill out. Were you thinking about the November 6th election and having a table? Well, I hadn't thought of it myself, but I think it's a great idea. It just seems to me that uh, you've got 10 to 12,000 people. Absolutely. You're, you're likely to get some real interest. Will we have time for this to go before council? So the full timeline, oh, to have what go before council? 
this because it's going to come out of ordinance and go to council for council. I don't know. That's a question. I, I don't think so. I think that the okay. survey is a is an effort from ordinance committee to inform ordinances okay. ordinance committee's that's, okay. kind of process. So we could certainly have it at the November sixth, um, and I could work with IT to see if we could have a couple of laptops set up there so yeah. people could fill those out as they were coming in. It's a great idea, as well as have a couple of paper copies available for people that would prefer to fill it out that way. I make life a lot easier. That's just a great idea. Right there. Uh, yeah. And uh, get the results. We review them at a November meeting yep, sure. and, and then give some direction mm -hmm. to yeah, they know the as far as drafting and development of ordinance provisions. What I've been sharing with people that have asked about the timeline is, is um, I've let them know that I couldn't imagine a scenario, especially like December meetings can be challenging to get you to know, um, that it would be surprising for this to get to council, the ordinance suggestions. You know, flesh out as, as in draft form out of ordinance committee and to council before March. That that would be a, a ch um, that that timeline would be because March is really the earliest we would expect to have any suggested language to council for their first readings and public hearings. And when's the date of our moratorium? I believe that our moratorium expires what? in January, but the state law is going to affect December 13th, and okay. so there's that overlap. So our moratorium becomes redundant on December 13th. Okay. Exactly, because it's up. Yeah. Right, right, right. Just wanted that to be clear. Will, do you have any no, I think comments? So. Or? I think <laughs> a really nice job was done with the survey. I don't have any things to recommend. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you for doing this. Um, I felt it covered pretty much the ballpark okay. on this. And I think that having a table and a questions at election is a brilliant idea. Because that way, there'll be residents. And uh, we generally get a pretty high turnout in Scarborough, so. Especially for a good election. Yeah. Uh, you're, yeah. You're going to be over 10,000. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I will um, plan on being there myself, but I'll also see if we can find a couple of other staff to, to help with that effort. Um, and are you comfortable with kind of breaking the mold of our past surveying and really kind of requiring residency on the survey? I don't think you'll need it if you do it at the polls. Yeah. But I, I would like us to have it in other forms as well, like on, for people that don't choose to vote, that still wish to share their opinion. I think asking if yes or no, whether you're a resident, is fine. Your thoughts? Well, you're, you're trying to get a representative sample. Right. And that just is, it, it does, if you vote or don't vote, it's not probably a factor on which you, it, it's that if you get, Hundreds in the hundreds. You've got a representative sample of the community, at that point. and you'll get it from the different ways in which you suggested it, approaching it. I don't think you need to overextend your effort on that regard. You named you named a lot of ways in which to get uh, survey results back, and uh, I think you'll probably have tremendous success at the at the election. Okay. You'll get, you'll get hundreds. So do you, would you prefer for me to, instead of, of working through the things that I had mentioned before, the schools and, and our kind of in-person... Uh, I only say it for efficiency's sake. Okay. Uh, so that you're not chasing your tail on trying to... I, I personally, I'd love to be proactive and reach out as much as possible. Um, right. But uh, yeah. I, I agree. I, I don't know that... I think it would be uh, make people disinclined to fill out the survey for yeah. It makes it easier for one one person. We don't get any risk of redundancy by having them done primarily at the polls. It, it, the validity of the survey, the credibility of the survey goes up. Okay. Which I like. I think that I agree. I think that the people that show up and vote on the day of the election that might be a, a, it's true. a self selecting a different population than what we would see. If we had the broader outreach, of, I do agree that there could be some redundancy. We might get more more surveys from the same individual. Yeah, I, yeah. I just uh, if a person voted early or if a person didn't vote, I'm not sure that that would alter the characteristic of the mix of people who you have turn in and give you results. I 
I, I wouldn't have thought that if you just took the people who show up to vote, that that would really change or alter the outcome. I don't know. Are we able to provide surveys as part of absentee voting? We absolutely. Uh, well, I, have to, I don't know, Tony. I realize that. <laughs> no. Yes, we, we, as a matter of fact, I wrote it down on my paper. Maybe for absentee voting. Yeah. Might be a nice way to. Yeah, I mean, I guess my concern there would just be the no print. I mean, it's not a, a one page thing, it's several pages of printing with every absentee ballot. That's right, another tree. Yep. Um, yeah, go ahead. We wouldn't be able to insert it with the ballots. Right. It would be those people who came to vote physically here at Town Hall. We could probably have some laptops sitting up in the poll. Oh, no. Ooh, oh, yeah. Nice. That's what I was thinking. Oh, the gentleman. I would say leave it to Larissa to use her best judgment on how to get it out there. But those are ideas to use the absentee process and, uh, and the day of the election process, and whatever else seems to you to be appropriate. Okay. And, and can I interject? I know Will and I understand we are thinking too about you know, making sure we get the broader. Why don't we concentrate right now on the election process? And see what the return is on that. See how many people, more or less, you know, if you feel we have to do further outreach, we could then go for, uh, move forward with some of the other avenues. Okay, so by, yes. by, December, by November 6th, I'll have a really good sense. Do we yes. do we get a, reason, a reasonable sample size right. just by targeting voters? Right. Yeah. And if we um, do not feel we have a reasonable sample size at that point, we could take through to the December meeting to fully get the, the survey data with the understanding that January's meeting will stay here until we hammer some things out. Yeah. Okay. We can also use those avenues to just advertise that, hey, if you are voting early or you are voting the polls, make sure that you stop by and fill our survey. Sure. Is that So, so a proposal of, I believe, aligning the language. 
that. Yeah, and that's on page two of the what, the twenty right. twice. Which covers the twelve weeks. Yeah. The no no medians, but only on the one. Yeah. And then she and then changing not the phone number but the address of the individual entity or organization that placed the sign. That's in line with the state law. They they use place also. Uh, I, I believe so. Yes. Yeah, I said yeah, that's right. Thank okay. you. Yeah, uh, we also have um, something here that talks about temporary signs, and it's from MRSA 1913A sub 1, etc., etc., etc. And you notice it says, the sign in this paragraph must include or be marked with the name and address of the individual entity or organization that placed the sign within the phone right away. And it says or. And most candidate, political candidates, I know we call them political candidates, I believe we call that signs, um, um, usually put either their name or the name of their treasurer as the, or the committee or whatever as the person who's placed the sign and then the address of that and whatnot. The uh, intent being that if they are in um, violation, in this case with states with DOT, the DOT knows who to contact if they feel signs or if a sign is needs to be removed. The the draft language. Uh huh. Uh, is which one are you talking about? Just for the audit. Uh, uh, this is temporary signs in the right of way. Yeah. Which is draft language that proposes to change it from six weeks to twelve weeks, mm -hmm. which I'm assuming is simply a reflection of conformance with state law yeah. to reduce confusion. Uh, since a lot of these signs are often related to political signs, that makes sense. And the second part came from where? From state law. Okay, so that, now we had talked about um, contact information as being a, uh, a, a better way to describe what it was we wanted to get off of the sign. We needed to be able, this says the address. Right. And when we, the ordinance as previously written was phone number. Right. Uh, uh, which we thought, good, if the phone number is on the sign, we can call them. And that would be the simplest way to, right. and that's how we arrived at it. Right, and it's become a nightmare in this current election cycle already. Yeah. Uh, I just have some personal, uh, not my on their signs, obviously, but people who have prepared signs got, are either haven't placed them yet or have placed them, but don't have phone numbers on them because they're following state rules. Exactly, which so, is which is a big argument for matching it up with state. Rules. Yeah, and Tony, if you don't mind. Talking a little bit more since you're the expert on the one we We pulled signs recently because they were in areas that they were not supposed to be where they were less than 30 feet apart. Some of the signs have phone numbers on them. Some have um, websites, which is easy to go to the website where they can, I can email someone or if there's a phone number or contact person that I can call and let them know that we pulled the signs. So, if we just keep it with the same verbiage that the state has, I think it will be, for, on my part, as far as contacting people, as long as a website is there, it's usually everybody has a website. I can go through that and find contact information in order to, if there's an issue with any of their signs. So, Trody, we, this language must include or be marked with uh, name and address of the individual. You think that would be? Individual entity or organization that placed the sign in the right of way and the date that the sign was corrected. Okay, so by giving you that much information, you'll be able to yes. effectively enforce the... Uh, um, well, we have a... Yeah, I, I think the aligning with the state makes a lot of sense. Um, I think the um, uh, some of the other suggestions that um, I mean, so 
primate. I don't know that we should in the organs try and indicate the color of the paint. Right. Um, That's a new process. <laughs> We're working on that one. Uh, the, I'd be fine with banning in all mediums, not just the mediums that are one. Um, well, I think that that's not advisable. Um, if, I think that, if, I could be wrong, but I believe that the city of Portland, the test case that we're kind of running on is the city of Maine, they banned signs and media. And uh, that's what, that but, right, it doesn't, so I think they, the blanket banning across all areas of, of, in a town is asking for a challenge. So that when we talked about identifying the intersections where we would prohibit signs, we didn't prohibit them at all intersections. We specifically chose intersections and, and explained why those intersections. So with medians, I think that where Portland already lost that lawsuit, I would, I would not encourage us to, to test it as well. My original, my original was to ban it, um, all of them, and then I got thinking some of the intersections, I think like um, 114 and 22, right. I really don't know if that's town owned property. So yeah. I figured along Route 1 would be a more, that's why I just suggested only Route 1. Okay. We can start with that. Anyway. I think that would pass. I think that I would want to hear Phil's thoughts on it, but I, if, if I can pretend to be Phil for a moment, as much as I see the good reason behind it, and certainly heard Brian as well say, look, you know, are, are people going out to check signs? That's just dangerous. Um, I think it's it's pretty it's, it's risky. It's that Route One is a major corridor, it's a major avenue of, of travel, and to prohibit along the medians across because you're it's, you're saying all temporary signs. We're not just talking about um, political signs. Right. It's temporary right. signs. Right. So that means somebody who, for instance, as we see in, in Portland, yeah. who's using a handheld sign standing in the median, you would be prohibiting them, and that was where the challenge came in Portland. I just, what do you, you're an attorney, Phil, what do you think? Well, it's clearly <coughs> has to have a uh, rational public policy, and public safety and uh, uh, aesthetic views were both considered by our council to be valid public policy. And that's where we banned them. Those are the two two places, uh, the busiest intersections that had the highest accident rates, uh, uh, and that that was the limit of the ban. Uh, so, uh, further bans are probably uh, very much subject to challenge. But I think that for our own staff safety, I, and I don't know how we could work this out, but I think we could say. You no, know, we will not be sending staff onto medians to check for content of the sign. We're not going to be sending, like, if it's a sign oh, that yeah. is, you know, if it's, if it's a sign that, if there's a, a row of signs all packed together, clearly in violation of the 30-foot rule, then we're willing to send staff in to, to remove those signs if we are not able to get the people who place the triggers for them. But that we're not going to send staff in, code enforcement staff in, to check to see if those signs in the median are compliant. I think that there's a way to protect our staff. Sure. But Cody, do you want to speak just for the benefit of the public to the uh, enforcement plan uh, with the IPs? I think it would yeah. be worthwhile having that noted for the benefit of the community. Right. Um, as everyone knows, we have a, a large contingent on both state and the local ballots. So uh, the volunteer police are going to be going out Wednesdays and pulling signs that are in non-compliant with our ordinance. At the intersections along the scenic vistas, if they're more than 30 feet apart, I already have a nice collection in my office <laughs> for contacting candidates. So, uh, but if anyone does have concerns or a complaint, just call the office and we will address it as, as soon as we possibly can. But as of right now, on Wednesdays, the VIPs will be going out and to the street with the well, community. Are you planning to ask them to do that every Wednesday? They are doing it every Wednesday until um, the election. Until the election? Yes. yes. Great. Thank you. I think the other, uh, I know that we talked about this last time, and I know that Mr. Longstaff was arguing against it, but I, I still think that uh, we, we reduced uh, business visibility when we went from two better times to one better time. Yeah. Um, and I'm open to go on uh, back to two. And Brian, do you have a sense?
sense of the impact of going back to two banner signs? Is there, any, you don't like one? is there any issue from your perspective that you want to weigh in on? I know you have spoken to this issue when we've discussed it before. Um, I don't really have much of an opinion either way. I know I've been approached by several folks from planning board and long range planning committee and other official town officials that they simply don't like the banners, period. Um, and the way our ordinance was written, you could have two as long as one said open. We had a lot of people abused it. They didn't have one that said open. They had one that they had two and they never had one that said open. And, you know, that was always a thorn in the side because we always had to go back and try to get them to take one of those down. But all they would see in the ordinance was two, two banners. They sort of oh. neglected to see that one had to say open. So it was always problematic, I think, from that perspective. But we recently went up and down Route 1 and, and I think you noted it, hopefully noticed that most people now are compliant. Any day now, a non-compliant one could pop up, so I'm not going to I'm not going to say that it's 100%, but it's much the, better. The, the adverse reaction that you heard from people, whether the planning staff, planning board, etc., cetera, uh, was it largely due to the proliferation? Yeah. This is too many flags. Just too many. Just too many banners flying. And um, a lot of them, you know, eventually become tattered and people take them down. We don't have anything that says they have to be in good repair. You know, so some of them get pretty ratty looking and those yeah. are even worse than the ones that, you know, so I, it, that's the comments that I've seen. I, 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 am, I have no opinion in it either way. Um, I don't think that there's anything wrong with staying with one and we have determined that for multi tenant locations, each tenant may have one. So you could theoretically have four or five of those things, uh, as long as they didn't say the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so so if now you say you could have two mm. instead of four or five, you can have ten. So I really, I feel like one's adequate, personally, but again, I, I, I serve only with the, the So I would see so, my understanding is that if we were now to go back to two, we, we couldn't dictate that one would have to say open because we can't, we have to become can't dictate. dictate. So, they have to do right. the, um, the argument that I've heard in favor of it was um, uh, having going to two is really um, so Beals Ice Cream over at, um, at Oak Hill, they have, they're, they're very set back. Um, and so, advertising is problematic enough for people to know that they're there. Um, but they can only have now one sign, so they have to choose whether they put it out on 114 or whether they put it out on by closer group one so people know mm -hmm. that they're there to come in. Um, they're by A, so they, yeah. Yeah. I would I would make the argument that um, personally I think one's plenty. Um, and that you know if I want to find something, I go on my GPS or whatever. Now I understand that not everyone has GPS. But Nor should they be using them while they're driving. <laughs> Well, they do, or they've, or they've got their, or they've got their, you know, person sitting next to them on their phone. But anyway, um, no. I personally think one's plenty, but that's I me. Mean, I'm not a big fan of givers myself. <laughs> so we currently allow two if the second one is open. We had in the past. We did, but you can't. Yeah, well, we changed the sign. Yeah. Because we were dictating content by saying it had to say open. Oh yeah. So that had to be taken out. So since the, the condition was you could have two only if one said open, we just went to one, and that solved the problem. Yeah. I'm I'm curious. So I I, I can look in the ordinance. I have it up on the, on the tablet. But I was almost thinking there was a provision where if you had frontage on two different streets, that you could have a temporary. Well, I know you can have a you can have a freestanding sign on two different streets. The total square footage of those freestanding signs can't exceed the square footage for one, but at least you could have two. So I don't know. Maybe that's something we can look at doing if we don't already have that for temporary signs or banners. We could look at doing that for banners as well. It seems to be prejudicial to people who don't have frontage on. You're talking corner lots, like 
Now Beals is not a corner lot because they are entering that little roadway I don't, I don't next to McDonald's. Oh, there's, there's a couple of different ways to get in there. Yeah. Uh, if you can get into there, probably one. There's three different ways to get in there, actually. Yeah.
coordinate the enforcement. So, in your opinion, Will? Um, I guess, do you have an opinion on the medians and on Rwanda's suggestion? Well, just put forward what you thought of. Uh, fair enough. Um, so I think if, if we're going to, if we're just going to change our enforcement policy, I think we could probably do away with the median restriction. Um, but, and then, uh, yeah, I'm happy with the alignment to the, both in terms of the duration as well as the uh, information required on the sun. And the language. I don't, I don't okay. think we, do we align with yeah. the state in terms of that place of the sign? Yeah. All right. So. Clean that up and then, and then hold on the rest. So you're saying allow them to place in the mediums everywhere? I, I'm saying that we, that we do not make the change that restricts um, as well as in the media that we, that we don't make that change and that we just okay. change our enforcement policy so that we won't put staff at risk. Um, and then uh, the uh, and then we all everything of the suggestion on page two that we put out. Yeah, the line that I want to state. Because what I want to do is just break this down into and three different votes. If, if, we, if we carry through with Apollo Brian's suggestions, I think the change in the color of paint is something that can be administratively right. addressed. Right. So that I think we and I think we agree with it. Yeah, that it was it was, it was it, more helpful if it was more visible. Yeah. Uh, I think she also is just defined, I guess I'm not at a point yet where I find the yeah. required. So actually, this ordinance has penalties associated with it as a, as a full ordinance, so we do have the authority to find if we wish to within the ordinance already. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Good. Thank you. Um, and then that plant to the sign that she's got well, there, that, again, that's, that's the covered language. by the state. Yeah. Um, we, we talked about the meetings. Yeah. Those are the only changes that she was okay. advocating for. Well, um, are you ready to vote? Yep. Um, uh, I'm going to summarize the... Yeah, the first vote I'd like to do is on um, Mr. Narvis has suggested we stay with one banner sign. All in favor well, of... Oh, we need to vote on that because we're not making the change. Oh, is that already? It's already, it's already. Oh, okay. So, so Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Too much coolness. The record <laughs> shows that that's how the committee feels. Yeah. No All right, problem. never mind. Cancel that. <laughs> okay, um, and we are not going to add the median, so that's because of the need of vote, because that's not exactly. going to yeah. So the only thing we're going to vote on is to align the language in section J1. J1, thank you. Uh, to align with, um, we're changing six weeks, strike six, and that, make that 12 weeks. Strike will include the, and add must include or be marked with. Um, then you've got name in, and then strike phone number of the person placing the sign, and add address of the individual entity or organization that placed the sign within the public right of way, and the date the sign was erected within the public right of way. All those in favor? And that's unanimous. That it? Yeah. Certainly, you say I made the motion. You want a second? Yeah, make that notice. Great, that was good. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's a good discussion on, on that whole business. I'm sure we'll be revisiting it from time to time. <laughs> okay, last but certainly not least are the boring regulations. Um, uh, if you may recall, this came before us, I forget when, and then they went back to, what's the committee name? Um, Coastal Water and Harbors. Thank you. And now they've come back, is that correct? Or is it you? I, sure. So we met about these, the mooring uh, situation months ago. Um, right. Then Harbor Master Ian Anderson came and spoke to you. Uh, and. After I came back to you with some draft language proposals, and then I believe it was Jean Marie who very wisely said, you know, there's a committee that's supposed to deal with this. Maybe this should start there. 
So I've worked with that committee um, for the last three months. I've gone to their meetings and worked to draft language with them. I think that there's a, I put a typo in here somewhere. I, so, I think we're missing yeah. some language. There, there should have been other language. I'm not sure what happened in that. Around the words and words. insurance? Yes. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It should be a violation of the ordinance in the harbor without a permit from the harbor master issued in accordance with this. There's some language there. I'm not sure what's happened. Um, it's probably something to do with... So, well, the trans sometimes when I transfer things from either Word to Docs or Docs to Word, things get funky. So I apologize for that, but the, the just the, of the idea is there. So um, the big changes are that you need to have, before you can get a permit um, for your mooring, you need to prove that you have registered that boat and have insurance on yes. the boat. Uh, also, another big change is that no more than two moorings will be issued to the same household. Yeah. No more than three moorings will be issued to the same commercial entity. Okay. Um, and just kind of highlighting to people that the sale of a boat does not ever include the sale of that mooring. That those are separate items that people cannot sell or rent moorings. Yeah. We've also suggested um, striking this entire chart and instead replacing it with the text and photo that you see on the second page. That is really lifted directly from the city of Portland. The Coastal yeah. Water and Harbors folks mentioned that we have so much crossover between the two groups right. that it makes good sense to have them match. Um, yeah. And so they suggested that we have them match. Yeah. Um, other change, so there's a bunch of changes in that chart. They also felt that with increasing storm activity, the, the uh, weight requirements and length requirements, I'm not really quite sure how that all works. Um, I've learned a lot meeting with them, but not enough to speak about it eloquently. Um, that we should really increase our, yes. our weight of our blocks and so forth to yes. match Portland to better reflect what we expect to be seeing as greater storm issues. Um, and then there's also some discussion of like really making it clear that you can't sublet your mooring space, and if you're going to have a visitor using your mooring space, that we need to create a, a mechanism for the harbor master to be told about that mooring space right there. Um, and then there's the last part, that section 1C, creation and maintenance of a mooring wait list. This is something that our town clerk's office was already doing, but we're just codifying the activity and making it clear that in order to be put, to be in order the first, to, okay, in order to get on the wait list, um, the first will be for commercial applicants and the second for recreational applicants. Commercial applicants will be verified by the harbor master and shall provide proof of a commercial state license or a federal permit. So that they, we don't want to have people saying that they're commercial when they're really um, recreational since the commercial one is so much shorter. Commercial applicants will, if requested by the harbor master, provide proof of commercial waterfront activity equaling 20% of their annual household income. So that was another safety check. We're trusting that the, the harbor master will be down and present enough to know who's commercial, who's not. Mm -hmm. But it gives the harbor master some protection. If they want to challenge somebody on their commercial viability, then the harbor master has the authority to say, "You need to prove to us that your commercially your commercial activity is is part of your is actually part of your income. If you don't just have a commercial permit that you pull through the state in order to get a board." Uh, and that the applicant seeking warrant should be placed on the waitlist in order of date and time of application. We've always done that. No one household should be allowed to hold more than two spots on the waitlist at any one time. That matches up with not being able to hold more than two permits. And that when a warrant becomes available, the town clerks will first consult the commercial waitlist, which will be <coughs> that was important for coastal waterfront houses people. They want to make sure that our working waterfront can remain working waterfront. Um, and it just kind of outlines how we'll work through that list. And just some language about if an applicant on the wait list has died, their spot may be reassigned to a legal heir providing the town of Scarborough has been notified within six months of the applicant's death. Mm -hmm. So we think we've covered all the of, of the big ones. Um, another big change, I'm sorry, on page one was the inspections of the, of the mooring. So all mooring gear should be inspected and are serviced by a mooring service company or by the owner with harbor master approval at least once biannually to determine the condition of gear and to ensure compliance with minimum standards set forth by these ordinance. And that's not language that we've had in the past. Yeah, I would agree with that language. Mm -hmm. um, Toby, do you mind talking about why this came about a little bit? I know we've talked about it before, but this is for the purpose of the public. So you're like, what, what are we doing that for? Well, one of the major 
because the wait list is 10 years long. Right. And we haven't really reviewed the ordinance in a number of years. Now that we have the Coastal Waters and Water Committee, we felt that it's worth to say, bring it to them, let them review it, and make the recommendations. Uh, the other, one other thing that we do in our office with regards to the wait list is every even numbered year, we send out a reminder or a, a, a letter stating, would you please contact us by such and such a date if you still want to remain on the list. And if we don't hear from them, it's a way of purging the list to make it smaller. Um, and I also think, and I'm not sure if there's verbiage in the ordinance or if it was even discussed, and it may change with uh, the new proper master, I'm not sure, is that we would give the person who is first on the list the option. And if they said, well, no, I'm really not able to do it, just give them that one time, you know, carry them over the next year. I don't know if that was discussed at the... Um, so, so it's actually in the line. So if the next name on either waitlist is unable to accept the morning, they may request to stay on their respective waitlist until the next morning becomes available. If at the time of the second morning becoming available, <coughs> the applicant again is unable to accept the morning, their name shall be removed from the waitlist. So that, 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 that would then just come back to the bottom of the ocean. So I think with the changes they've made, it's going to help move things along. And is there a timeline, I believe, that they have to have everything? By yep, so you, registration and yeah, you have to have moored your boat by July 1 of that calendar year in order to continue to have that mooring. One of the things that we heard from the Coastal Waters people, call Coastal the committee members, um, is that there are people that are holding moorings with no boat. On the off chance that someday they're going to have a boat, or that they're going to get their boat repaired and, and, and registered and insured, yeah. and that that is unfair to the people that have boats that they could be using. Yeah. Also, the town has, um, I believe, two, two more or three, and those are, if, as you indicated on um, earlier, if somebody has some woman <coughs> and a friend that has a boat, they can make arrangements to use one. Well, so called public water. Yeah. Would, would, it, would it be helpful for us to get a report from the Harbor Master uh, uh, sometime in August as to? what the consequence was as far as uh, boats must have been moored by July 1. Uh, it would be helpful, I think, to know whether there was any effect. And we do send a list of uh, <coughs> who have not put their boat in water or the moor is vacant, and then the um, harbor master does make the determination. But we can, we can provide that list to them. So if we could you could ask the Harbor Master to provide us with a report in the calendar to remind him in July. Mm -hmm. So that, that way it would be good for us to know if, if this thing is in effect right. and operative. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so I just had a question. Are we, are we currently prioritizing commercial on the wait list? Um, we have two separate lists. So we you have a recreational list and a commercial list. That's correct. Correct. Anything else? Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, I think I heard you said 10 current government lists. Or do we have changes in government lists? We are, our current, our Ian Anderson gave us notice his last day was the first week of September. Sure. And we are in the process of hiring <coughs> a replacement government master right now. Great. Um, just as, as someone who does own a commercial boat business uh, ownership and one. I think these make perfect sense. I like how you, we've lined up uh, with the Portland ordinances because Portland, they're pretty strict about what they allow and don't allow. Um, and a lot of these are based on postcard uh, I know regulations and, and uh, recommendations for what people do for moorings uh, for safety reasons so they don't break away and you don't have issues uh, uh, in storms. And I, I personally, I think it's a great idea that if you can't get your boat out there by July 1st, then too bad. I mean, you put it out there. Because we have such, a, the mooring field in Scarborough is so limited because of the tidal situation in the river yeah. that, you know, it's, we want it to be as fair to everyone. And I absolutely get, you know, that the commercial folks, you know, if they're fishing out of here, lobstering out of here, you know, whatever they're doing, they should have their own list and have a bit of priority, in my own opinion. So. 
is there any provision for uh, leniency if there was an illness, for instance? So a person had not gotten their vote in by July 1st? So we talk we talked about that at the committee level. The idea is that the harbor master will really know what that's what's going on. And these permits are issued as of January when they're calendar year permit. So that is giving them a solid six months of time to have been able to put a boat in the water. Um, so it, it seems unlikely that that will come up, but that the harbor master would have the authority to... Discretion. Sure. Yeah. So, so there is actually a, something that is done, filed every year, so that even though, even though I have yes. my permit, I mean, I have my mooring. Yes. I'm going to have it again until I abandon it. But um, I do have to put in paper, so we have a touch point so that they know that yes. we can tell them July one people have to Is the commercial wait list long? I think there's like six or seven yeah. people. Oh, so yeah. And the recreational list? It's <laughs> <laughs> so Okay. Yeah. And is it uh, previously? Then the policy to favor the commercial over the when it when it became available. It also depends on the, is it the draft of the vote. Yes. And the location. That's right. So right. A lot of times it would depend on the size of the boat, and um, it wasn't always commercial like that. Simply because the location of the yeah. Lorant was so not so compatible with the size of the boat. Because of low, at low tide over there, though, if you walk around Ferry Beach at low tide, you see quite a number of smaller recreational boats they sit on the mud. And, yeah. the, and the commercial boats can't sit on the mud. You, you, you have to I see them out. Boats <laughs> in the Spur Wink River. Yeah. The yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So Coastal Waters and Harbor, because we'd like to get this through Council yeah. prior to January 1, sure. so yes. New yep. can, and we think that given the number of um, multiple holders, that so we've got a couple of people that have four warrants that are just recreational users, they would be brought down to two. We think we can probably, with these changes, at least clear the commercial list and start working our way through the, through the other one. Okay. So, um, but we would like to have time to get letters out to mooring holders to let them know that these changes are being proposed prior to the council sure. seeing this. Sure. So, if if you are pleased with this language and willing to pass it on to council, I think I would recommend that maybe we look to have this on more like a November council meeting to give time for those letters to get out to mooring yeah. holders, or at least the second meeting in October. So, there's no time. Sure. Did Coastal Harbor support these changes unanimously? Yes, which is why they're with you today. Which is amazing. That's, well, that's very important if there was unanimity in their voice. So. Yeah. That's good. I, I think I'd move uh, adoption of the proposed changes uh, as appearing in the. Wait a second. Uh, I'll second. I'll finish. Oh. As appearing in item seven of the agenda. Second. Yep. I'm all in favor. And just as a clarification. Because we lost the first yes. part of the sentence, we understand the staff is going to go in and do the first part of the sentence. <laughs> fixing that correction. Right. If that is not, if it is a material provision that inadvertently was left out, let us know. And yeah. It's going to say something along the lines of uh, mooring permits, uh, people uh, seeking mooring must prove ownership of boat, like through boat registration and insurance. And uh, yeah, that would not be. Okay. All right, motion to adjourn. Move. All in favor. Uh, did you want to discuss what the oh, next time, or did we do that part of the yeah. agenda? The who, the what? Do we, as a group, talk about what's going to be on the agenda next time, or do you and I do that privately? We can do that privately. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I will let you know. If we have suggestions, we'll provide them. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.